Yeah. PenguinCon 2015. <laughs> Geneticist. Um, so that's what all those fancy letters after my name mean. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. I've been working in genetics since 2008. Um, I've published 11 papers. I've presented at half a dozen, uh, maybe a dozen conferences now. Um, primarily, my area of expertise is actually medical genetics. Um, I spent a number of years working on cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy. I actually still work on spinal muscular atrophy. Um, my master's degree um, focused primarily yeah. in computational genomics. Um, so I spent a lot of time writing code in the last two years. Um, and my area of interest in particular is long non-coding RNAs, which I'm not going to really talk about today. But um, if you saw me last year, I gave an excited talk about all the fun that uh, um, annotational genomics is. And, uh, that's what I actually do in politics. So I actually need to start a new job soon. Uh, the uh, New, York, New York State Department of Health um, so I'm assistant director of their newborn screening program. Coming up here, just a couple of months. Um, so, to come back to Society of It is, the Design Society for Clinical Pathology. Good. Issue both of my board certifications. Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> wow. I have never lectured to this many people before. <laughs> in all my years of grad school and all of the presentations I've been at conferences, I don't think I've ever had a room this bowl for a science talk. This is awesome. I don't know. Okay. So, again. The topic of the panel is why everything you why everything you know about you think you know about genetics is wrong. I got a question. Sure. Uh, I guess first off, what's the chemical on your <laughs> <laughs> which one? Because I have several. The left one. Uh, oh, that's 17 beta estradiol. Help me out. <laughs> um, that is the that is the uh, three hydroxyl the, the two hydroxyl version of uh, human estrogens. There are Can three we see human them again? estrogens: estrone, so. And the other one is a, I guess a, a double helix, yeah. Another question I have is, is this material that you're presenting, is that something we can look at online? It, is, have to... it, it isn't, unfortunately, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, a, a lot of research. Yeah, some of, some of my slides and stuff are, are copyrighted um, by other colleagues, so I can't share them. Okay. I don't hold the, the, I hold the IP to share it, I don't hold the IP to, 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 hope I to present it, I don't hold the IP to share the, the slides. So. I have to be really careful about such things. So there's some data in here and all that. that I can't if, I, if I wanted to reference it, how would I do so? Would I just email you? Um, to, to find reference. Uh, if I were writing my own paper, not that I'm, not that I'm there. Oh, uh, if I were writing my own paper, something would I reference yours, or would? Yeah, I mean, generally you're not gonna you're, like you can't really cite a talk at a convention. Like, right. it's not a professional meeting. If it were a professional meeting, then I could give you a handout. I could give you a syllabus. I could tell you, you know, that kind of thing. But this is a for fun kind of situation. Okay. So this is more. Just for, and that's, um, taking a little bit of back, I, I'm going to try and keep this to to a, an 8th grade, to, an 8th grade to 12th grade science level. Um, obviously, I have a master's degree in genetics. I, I, I could easily talk about this way up here and bore you all to death. Um, and you'll be super lost for an hour, and that's not any fun for anyone. So I'm going to try and keep this 
um, relatively um, simple on the science. Um, there are questions about the science. Um, feel free to ask. Um, I'm going to try and keep giving you a fair amount of material. Um, I apologize if it's a little bit over your head. Um, some of it may be a little more complex if you've not had at least a, like a, a, an undergraduate biology class. Um, but we'll try and get there. So really should have. I gave, a, I gave a genomics 101 talk last year, um, or I actually did teach you about basic biology, but we don't have time for that today. So, okay. Why did they. <laughs> um, so, why did they lie to you? Why did your science teachers tell you all this terribly wrong information about genetics back when you took high school or you know, middle school biology? Um, probably because they didn't know any better. <laughs> um, in not, not to, you know, to me, uh, high school science teachers, but most of them are not graduate trained geneticists. Uh, most of them have had maybe a single course in genetics. Uh, <laughs> so they don't always, are not always uh, educated on some of like, the, the more cutting edge. You know, some are, and that's awesome, but a lot of times uh, they just don't have the background to discuss these things in depth. Um, which again, can, can be to an education so if they're a bachelor's trained biologist or not even an actual biologist, then not necessarily going to have the background to really discuss these in, in, in depth. Um, and the field is very rapidly evolving. Um, one of the interesting, I think, things people forget about genetics is how much it's changed over just the last five years um, with the advent of genomic technology. So a lot of what we now know about the human genome and genetics and genomics um, are things we've learned in the last five years, three years, two years, six months. Um, so if people aren't spending a lot of time keeping up on exactly what's going on in the literature, it's easy to forget that some of a lot of the things that we thought of as common knowledge 10 years ago have been basically erased. Um, or it was just too much to explain. Some of this is actually really complicated, um, and trying to teach that to a 13-year-old thir like is kind of insane. Um, so we don't do that. Uh, we break it down to simplifications that they can understand because it teaches basic science literacy, and that's also really important. So, um, you went to school anyway. <laughs> Just is, the state of Texas isn't very good at um, teaching science these days. Um, or because, you know, scientists are funny and they, you know, they like to mess with 13-year-olds you know, and tell them all information to see what happens. That's an experiment and that's funny to me. Um, uh, so why do I care that you know everything you know about genetics is wrong? Are you telling us wrong information now to see what happens? <laughs> That would, would you, be a would you, psychologist would, experiment. That's true. <laughs> I would have to have my review approval for that, which I don't have. So I might have to like, get your informed consent and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I care? Because I think it's interesting. So obviously you do too, because you showed up to my talk. <laughs> um, so uh, I think these things are fun to talk about, and it's fun to take apart the sorts of things that we think was common knowledge science and actually break down and see where they don't actually hold up. Um, because I hope you think it's interesting, and obviously you, because we showed the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, so you're here and you're actually listening to me talk about this crap, so. Um, these people think genetics isn't advancing. I touched on this a minute ago. Uh, people seem to think that like genetics stopped and once we discovered DNA and basic <laughs> oh, um, You'd be surprised when people are like, how are you, well, how are you a genetics researcher? What, didn't we discover everything we knew about genetics by like 1955? Like, no, no, or, or, you know, the Human Genome Project is completed, so we, we don't need to, need to do genetics research anymore. No, actually, it's really important, and we're still doing a ton of really awesome stuff. So, you know stuff about genetics, and you support people funding our research. And for those of us who are live on grant money, um, we want people to support that. Um, and because you want to know your blind spots. Um, you know, science education is important, science literacy is important. So um, if you think you, you know, when people think they really just, you know, something is a very common sense idea in science and don't understand that those, those uh, concepts might be more complicated, um, they often tend to, you know, simplify those arguments or not understand when, when complexities come up. So um, knowing that you, not everything you learned in eighth grade science is actually true um, helps you be aware that you might have some blind spots when it comes to science literacy. So, now that we've introduced why I'm talking about all of this, let's actually talk about some genetics. So, myth number one, independent assortment. So, think back to your eighth grade science class, and you were told way back then that every allele, so which is a copy of a gene, assorts completely independently. That no one gene is dependent on another gene being inherited. So, you went back and you did your Punnett squares and you talked about random chance and probabilities and all of that good stuff. Um, 
And that's true, sort of, uh, but it's actually way more complicated than that. Uh, what's actually going on is something called chain linkage. Um, the closer genes are on the chromosome, because they, act, they occupy a position within the genome on a chromosome, the closer they are together, the more likely those alleles are to sort together. Um, during meiosis, uh, which is the process in which we create um, our sex cells, um, an event happens called crossing over. You probably heard a little bit about crossing over back in your intro genetics class. Uh, and that's where the genome actually crosses back on itself um, to basically assort those genes um, and mix up what goes on each chromosome. Um, because of the actual chemistry involved in the physics, actually, um, the closer those things are together, the harder it is for, those th for things to cross over in between them. The less likely it is for a crossing over event to occur in between those genes. Um, so there are certain genes that tend to just assort together, or actually more specifically alleles that tend to assort together. Um, because they're just located so close together on the genome that it's really unlikely you're going to get a crossing over event. Um, obviously, that's when things are on the same chromosome. Genes that, exist, that are on separate chromosomes completely independent assortment unless something really weird happens. Um, which they do happen, but not the topic of this conversation. So, um, a really good example of this, and, and if there are any blood bankers in the room, they'll be excited to hear this. If there aren't, you're all going to be bored. Um, has to do with uh, a set of um, proteins on your red blood cells called the Rh factors. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the, the, the Rh factor that is in your blood type, the positive or negative. That's actually just RHD. There are, in fact, four other Rh proteins that are also um, inherited and exist on your red blood cells. And those are inherited to something we call a haplotype. Um, and a haplotype is simply a group of alleles that assort together and tend to be inherited as a group. Um, so you know, things like the, your Rh factors are inherited as a, as a set, of, in, in the case of Rh, as a set of like three alleles together. Um, you'll, have, you'll have three out of three from one parent, three from the other, um, but those tend to not cross. They tend to just hang out all together um, and be passed as a group on to, uh, to your offspring. So, what I'm, you know, and, and there are actually ways we can calculate this. Um, there's, a, there's actually a, a set of calculations called linkage dis disequilibrium, what we can do in populations, uh, where we can examine how closely, um, how different genes assort together and look at reasons why that is. Um, also, genes that are closer to the centromere, which is that, that um, squeezed bit in the middle of your chromosome, uh, those tend to be more closely linked than those farther out on the long arms and the short arms of your chromosomes. So, so you're saying that the, when the genes do meiosis, when the chromosomes do that meiosis, the genes will break across in stripes, but if that little diagram did before the pea plant is a single gene, which is a very small stripe, then it would actually be accurate for that, but it wouldn't be accurate for more general, broader things that have more than one gene controlling them, you're saying? Uh, that's, we'll, we'll get to that. That's, that, um, that's, that has to do with multifocal genes. That's a different situation. Uh, this is more the fact that, um, and, and this is off the top of my head, I can't, I, I'm picking random genes off the top of my head, but say your, your, your RAP4 gene is next to your uh, CCR5 gene. Um, and they're on the same chromosome, and they're really close together. Um, you know, maybe they, they, they share a common promoter or something like that. Um, if there's not much genomic space in between them, they will tend to assort together. So when you, when you have a crossing over at meiosis, um, that, will, that will cross over as a package. That makes sense. As a think, stripe. Right. Or two stripes, really. Right. Uh, two stripes that are mashed together. Um, and you won't often separate the two stripes into separate stripes. Does that make sense? And the middle won't go between them? Very rarely. That's, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very statistically improbable. And that's what we have to remember about genetics, is that genetics is largely based on statistics. Sure. Um, because you're talking about lots and lots and lots, billions of, billions of cellular events aggregated over millions of individuals. Is the longest chromosome that the alleles that, or the loci at either end, isn't it the, the likelihood that they will cross over at any given time more likely about 1%? Um, ooh, off the top of my head, um, crossing over events, I mean, there are, there are interesting frequencies about crossing over events, but um, generally more crossing over happens at the ends of your chromosomes than happens uh, near the side of the air. But I mean, even, even the most likely Crossing right. over is much less than any 50%. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, crossing over, again, 
many crossing, I mean, many crossing over events happen during meiosis, but the probability of any one site being a crossing over site is very, very small. Um, so, independent of SARC, but not actually a thing. Kind of a thing if you think they're on separate chromosomes, but it's not an absolute rule like you were probably talking way back in X101. So, um, myth two, this is my favorite one because this is what I work on, uh, <laughs> junk DNA. How many of you um, think that like 97% of your genome is junk? It's, it's not encoded, that's not the same. <laughs> I'm getting there, I mean, okay. sorry, it's my, my talk. <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 let me actually think so. No one actually thinks that, that's awesome because everyone thought that, even Genesis thought that until like six years ago. Um, so, this is what you were probably taught. Um, it's a little small, unfortunately, I'm sorry about that. Um, you were taught that like 97% of your genome was junk because only 3% of it codes for proteins. And everyone thought for years that the only thing that mattered in the genome was the stuff that coded for protein. Uh, and everything else was just inherited junk that didn't have any function, that just hung around and took up space. Um, the only real use anyone ever proposed for it is that it um, you know, it could, those sites could accumulate mutations that wouldn't actually harm anything. So you were hiding the important parts of your genome in this vast sea of nonsense. Um, nonsense in the like colloquial term, not in the genetics term. <laughs> uh, so that when you had a, had a mutation, it was, it was very, very unlikely to actually cause any harm because, you know, if only one in three, but only, you know, three in uh, 30, one in 30 uh, words, one in 30 bases um, actually matters, then 29 of 30 mutations that don't actually do anything. And that's awesome. That keeps you from getting cancer, because no one wants cancer. Um, and this really was, I, I mean, really until like 2008, 2009, um, this was a very pervasive view. And there are actually still some folks in the community who, who actually still believe this. But we've actually got a lot of information as we've been able to um, sequence both whole genomes and whole transcriptomes, which is the sum of an RNA in a cell or in a cell population. Um, that tell us this really isn't true. Um, what's actually going on, um, so you have your whole, this is gonna be a little high level, so I apologize, ask questions if it's confusing, but so there's your whole genome. Um, about 53% about of this thing's called repetitive sequences. Um, and that's things like transposable elements, large and small duplications, um, simple repeats. Um, Um, about 20% are other progenic sequences. That's um, 25% uh, uh, introns and uh, untranslated regions. Um, and about 1.5% protein coding sequences. Um, so, actually, um, what's interesting though is all of that stuff um, that's not the, the, the 98, the, the, that isn't the 1.5% that uh, codes for proteins actually does a lot of stuff. Um, so, uh, the intergenic sequences, uh, we now know, uh, contain things called promoters, enhancers, and repressors. Um, those are regions of the genome where specific proteins bind um, that either activate translation, or sorry, transcription, um, to produce RNAs which later produce proteins sometimes, so we'll get to that in a minute, um, or actually for, uh, close the chromatin so it can't be accessed by things like RNA polymerase to make RNAs. Uh, so there are actually these thousands and thousands, actually billions of control points. Um, some as small as eight or ten nucleotides, and some as small, and some as large as um, fifty or sixty. Um, and many genes will have multiple promoters, enhancers, uh, and repressor sites. So a very, very layman's term is kind of like scaffolding needed for everything else to do his work. Uh, it is. Um, th think of it as um, control relays, almost. Okay, um, right. Switches that turn things on and off. Um, but the switches themselves are actually built into the DNA structure, into the coding, I'm sorry, not the coding screen, into the genomic structure. Um, those transposable elements, um, provide, that's a little bit more complicated, and I'm not going to get super into the details of transposable elements, but um, those do also serve genomic functions. Um, the other thing that we found in that region are something called long non-coding RNAs, uh, which is again a, a relatively recent discovery. We've known about small non-coding RNAs for years. That's things called like micro RNAs. If you put about micro RNAs or snow RNAs, small nuclear, small nuclear uh, nuclear RNAs. Um, 
Um, we've known about rRNAs, ribosomal RNAs, for decades and decades. Um, but in the last 10 or 12 years, we've, we've really discovered these long non-coding RNAs, which are more than a, just defined as anything more than 100 bases. Um, and as it turns out, they do all kinds of really super important things, but they don't make protein. Um, they act simply by themselves. They do things like turn other genes on or turn other genes off. Um, sometimes they'll bind messenger RNAs, which are the things that are normally translated into proteins, uh, to prevent them from making proteins. Um, some of them are involved in processes like X inactivation, if you're familiar with X inactivation. Um, that's where one of the X chromosomes that we make gets turned off. Um, it happens in every cell. It's a totally random event, but it's a very specific biological process that's actually um, entirely mediated by long non coding RNAs. No, very different concept. Um, so, as it turns out, most of the genome is actually pretty important. Um, and the current theory is actually that about 80 to 85 percent of the genome is actually transcribed. Uh, transcribe, uh, transcription is a process by which DNA is trans, transcribed into RNA, which is the thing that does things in the cell. Uh, and there have been a couple of fairly big studies that have demonstrated that um, you know, if you look at a population of, say, 100,000 cells, you digest those cells, you pull out all the RNA that's in there uh, floating around in their cytosol, and you sequence it um, using things like uh, next generation sequencing, uh, you'll actually find things that align to about 80% of the genome. Um, which means it's called conspicuous uh, translation, or I'm sorry, transcription. Um, so we don't really know 100% of why all this happens. Um, like I said, uh, I, work, I work in long non-coding RNAs, and um, we've identified about 15,000 long non-coding RNAs. We know what about, about 150 of them do. <laughs> uh, so it's a really fruitful area of research. It's a really awesome thing. I actually wrote my master's uh, thesis on long non-coding RNAs in the brain uh, related to uh, a mental illness or obsessive compulsive disorder and schizophrenia. So, so junk DNA, not actually junk. Uh, here's my favorite. Um, the central dogma. How, you, how many of you know what the central dogma is? A few of you. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll go over it very, very quickly. Um, so what you think. This is the central dogma in a beautiful diagram. DNA, which is what is what makes up your genome, is transcribed into RNA, which are single-stranded nucleotide molecules. Um, that RNA is then translated into protein, which is the thing that does stuff in your cells. <coughs> Um, this has been this has been like the core of all molecular biology teaching for like 40 years. Um, it's one of the first things you learn in genetics class and in the molecular biology class. The central dogma gets beaten into your head, um, but it's not quite as true as you like to think. Um, so, um, there we go. Um, the first part. And I was just talking about these things, long encoding the RNAs. We don't always translate RNA into protein. In fact, it seems like the vast majority of RNAs are not transcribed. Um, the most, most of the act, sorry, sorry Paul, yes, well, are non-translated. Um, so they, they don't code for proteins. They don't have open reading frames, um, but they exist. Some of them exist in huge numbers, um, but they are made into protein. Um, one of, the first discovered, one of the first important things of non-translated uh, RNA that we discovered and the most important uses is actually the elongation of telomeres. Um, they act as the template to elongate telomeres. They actually get, uh, they get incorporated in a specific telomerase, uh, which is the enzyme that elongates the telomeres, which are the things that decrease in size at the end of your chromosomes every time they replicate uh, as part of cellular aging. Um, so we need to elongate those so you can continue to divide your cell um, using an enzyme called telomerase. Uh, and the template with which you build those is actually a long encoding RNA. Um, so RNA is not always transcribed into protein. Um, RNA is not always, it's, not, it's commonly taught that you know, the DNA to RNA is a, is a unidirectional process, that DNA is only ever transcribed into RNA. But that's not true. Oops. Ah. Um, it's a good thing called reverse transcription. 
Um, this was first discovered actually in viruses, uh, things called RNA viruses, um, where there is a small viral genome uh, consists entirely of RNA. Uh, and when the virus inserts itself into a cell, um, there's an, it codes an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Uh, and what that does is actually copies that, uh, that piece of RNA into DNA and sticks it somewhere in the genome. Um, it's part of the, the sort of taking over of the, the cellular machinery to manufacture more virus particles. Um, HIV is a great example of a, called a retrovirus, uh, RNA virus. Um, this happens all the time. Um, it's, we actually use this technique lots now in um, molecular biology. We can actually use synthetic reverse transcriptase to um, do really cool molecular biology techniques. Um, but when I just talked about uh, telomere elongation, well, reverse transcription actually is how we elongate telomeres. So telomerases itself are reverse transcriptase. Uh, so sometimes RNA goes back to DNA. Oops. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, myth four. Everything is in the code. So for years and years, uh, most people are taught in intro level genetics classes that everything having to do with the cell, everything, everything you care about in the cell was encoded in the genome, and the raw code, and, the, and the, the, G, the A's and G's and T's and C's that make up the sequence of your genome, and that nothing else could possibly matter. Um, so that's your, you know, that's your genetic code that codes for all of your 20 amino acids that make up your proteins, uh, and that's sort of the conventional thinking that's still taught in most science classes. But uh, we actually have an entire process, an entire field actually called epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics is a Above the, literally above the genome. Um, and these are modifications to the DNA chromatin, the, the things that make up your chromosomes, um, that don't actually alter the code of your DNA, but significantly affect the function of the cell. Um, one of the best known is something called DNA methylation, uh, where we add a methyl group um, onto certain bases uh, within the genome, um, usually C's, um, methyl cysteine, um, and what this does is generally turn off a gene. Um, when you methylate the genome, um, you you, it makes it more difficult for RNA polymerase to bind. It's harder to transcribe uh, that particular gene. Uh, and there are whole processes that control these methyl, they're called methylation marks. Um, not surprisingly, with enzymes called methylases and uh, demethylases. Um, and this is something we study a lot um, in aggregate. So we'll look at total methylation in a, in a cell. Um, using some specific molecular biology techniques to get an idea of what's going on with things like cellular stress. Um, and organisms that are higher stress tend to have more methylated genomes. Um, there, and then you can also look at specific methyl marks at certain genes to look to see how those genes have been affected by um, environmental status. So these are actually things that, um, that Bonnie does in response to primarily to environmental factors. Um, the other uh, epigenetic modifications are, modi are, are modifications to the histones. Um, so when, when DNA is all, all wound up in a chromosome, it's wound around these very specific um, little proteins, or actually, um, uh, they're actually polymers, are usually um, four proteins, or I'm sorry, eight proteins, um, that we generally present as balls, and the, the DNA itself winds around those, and it helps pack that DNA really close. That's how you get those really nice visible chromosomes when you see them under a microscope. Um, and when DNA is wound really tight around uh, the histones, it, again, it can't be accessed by, accessed by RNA polymerase. It can't, um, you can't get promoter proteins to get in there to bind, um, to initiate um, transcription. Um, and how closely the DNA is wound to the histone is controlled by modifications to those histones. Um, and there are all kinds of, there, there <coughs> are lots and lots of different histone marks. Um, you, can, you can methylate them, you can acetylate them. Um, that change, um, either make the, the DNA wind tighter or looser. Um, and those actually correlate, um, you can actually look at those um, through some like biology techniques like uh, Gypsy. Um, and you can actually pull down the specific kinds of protein. Uh, again, more technical than you can get into. Um, but as it turns out, certain kinds of methylation marks, um, uh, histone marks, are associated with different kinds of genome, different sections, different functions of the genome. So there are methylation marks that are, or sorry, histone marks that are correlated to uh, promoters, that are correlated to enhancers, that are correlated to repressors. Uh, that helps us understand um, or look for 
um, either genes that we didn't know were there yet, especially when we're looking at long encoding RNAs. Um, and sometimes we also use that to find um, protein coding genes that we hadn't found yet. Uh, it helps us again just to understand uh, how the, uh, how, the uh, how the genome is turned on and off. So um, these actually have huge effects um, on the physiology of the cell. Um, if you if you strip if you, you add chemicals it strips all the methylation marks off the genome, you will wreck a cell because um, it loses all.